everybody my name is Clantis and welcome to the Iron Bars my true crime YouTube channel so with that said let's get into today's case and it is the case of Teho Fato Pule so I'm just going to be calling her Teho because it's a long name and it's got some twists that you have to make with your tongue so we're just gonna call her Teho Teho Pule. So Teho Fatsa Pule was born in 1992. Unfortunately, I could not find her date of birth as well as her zodiac sign. Teho Fatsa was born in Midlands Township of Soweto in Johannesburg. She was the eldest child of four children to her mom and dad. So Teho's family were very close. That also included her aunts, her uncles, cousins, nieces and nephews. Everybody was just a close-knit family. They loved each other. They looked after each other and they looked out for each other and they made sure that the family was put together. If there was any disagreements, they made sure that they ironed out and so they were able to move forward as a one close-knit family. This is a family that believed that it took a village to raise a child, especially one of their own. So they took no chances when it came to the children of the Pules. Tsekhofato was described by everybody that met her, including her own family, as a girl that was very happy. She was humorous. She made sure that people were happy and laughing at the same time. And she had a huge interest in the beauty world as well as fashion. Tsekho Fasipule used the makeup to make other people feel very happy and confident about themselves. For her, it was not necessarily about the external beauty, but it was about the feeling of beauty. In as much as Tsekho Fatso promoted external beauty, but she believed that a human being should be beautiful on the inside. However, the outside just needed some enhancement in order for the beauty inside to feel complete. Unfortunately, when Teho Fatsa turned about 18 years old, she lost both her mom and dad. Unfortunately, I could not really find out what killed them. I'm assuming probably an accident or something along those lines. However, because the Pule family were a close-knit family, Teho Fatsa's mother's sister decided to take her as well as her siblings in and raise them herself as her own. So not only the aunt took over the kids, but the entire Pule clan came and rallied around these kids, making sure that they were well taken care of, went to school, well fed, as well as clothed. So when Teko Fato Pule graduated from high school, she decided to go and enroll at a beautician or a cosmetology school, where she became a beauty technician. As far as everyone could tell, Teho Faso's life seemed to be going well herself. She was feeling fulfilled, content, but there was one thing that was missing in her life, love. But Teho was not concerned about being in love or having a boyfriend or things around that. All she wanted to make sure was that she became successful in a cosmetology career that she just begun. She wanted to be independent and have her own money so that she would be able to help her aunt in raising her siblings. And that's exactly what Teho Fatso did. However, in 2018, Teho Pule met a man by the name, I cannot believe that he has my name. Remember guys, in my live stream, I said to you, I've got three names. I never necessarily told you what were the other two names. You guys know Clances, but you don't know my other two names. So my first name is Ntutuko. The second name is Ntlanta. So Teho Faso meets this man by the name of Ntutuko, my name. My namesake. This gentleman was Ntutuko Shoba, who was about 30 years old when he met Teho Faso. He was born in 1989 or around there. Unfortunately, he too, I could not find his date of birth. However, he kind of like gives me Germani vibes. Ndutugo Shoba was well educated. He worked at the Johannesburg Stock Exchange in the IT division as an analyst. So both Takofato and Ndutugo Shoba fell head over heels in love with each other. They could not live a day without each other. Everybody that saw that relationship felt that it was such a cute couple. They were basically showing couple goals. They were showing the it couple 
everybody just loved them and they enjoyed a very healthy social lifestyle both on social media as well as in society i'm thinking because ndutugo is a johannesburg stock exchange analyst of some sort and he earns a real good money so he was respected amongst his peers Unfortunately, in 2019, Pule lost her job at a salon that she was working at. Apparently, the salon was not doing quite as well as they had thought, so they had to let her go. Tsakofaso was devastated at the loss of her job. However, Ndutugo just came and said, listen, I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to make sure that you always have money. You always have clothes on your back. You will always have a roof over your head. I will even take care of your siblings, making sure that they are going to school and also become whatever it is that they want to become while she is busy looking for a job and indeed Ndutugo was the man of his words he made sure that Tsekhofatso was happy she had everything she ever wanted he spent money on her he made sure that she had data she had airtime or, or units whatever you call it to make phone calls and text each other whenever they are separate and also made sure that she always had some money in her pocket Whenever Tsekhofatso was sending out her resumes and also going to interviews for jobs, Ndutugo made sure that he requested her an Uber that would take her from her place to wherever she was going to have an interview at and bring her back home, as well as making sure that she had money to use the internet to send her resumes to more prospective employers. So definitely Ndutugo Shoba was an ideal boyfriend. And Tsekhofatso felt so lucky to have Ndutugo in her life. With the money that she was getting from Ndutugo, Tsekhofatso made sure that she contributed to her aunt's household because she was bringing up her siblings as well. So the aunt was quite happy that Tsekhofatso was in a relationship with a good man. In the same 2019, Tsekhofatso fell pregnant by Ndutugo. So Tsekhofatso, excited and happy to announce to her boyfriend that she was pregnant, unfortunately in Dutugo, put an end to it. He ordered her to commit an abortion. Tsekhofatso was quite disappointed, however, she did terminate her pregnancy. When Tsekhofatso asked Ndutugo, why did you order me to commit an abortion? That is when Ndutugo told her that it was a mistake to begin with. But Tsekhofatso did not understand why her loving boyfriend did not want to tell her the real reasons why he wanted her to commit an abortion. But Ndutugo once again shut her down and just made sure that they never spoke about this again. So Tsekhofatso, because she did not want to lose the things that she was getting from Ndutugo, she decided to let it go. So the relationship went back on track. They were lovey-dovey. They were like the example couple. Everybody envied. And he was just doing the most for Tsekhofatso, making sure that she was the happiest girlfriend. So in 2020, Tsekhofatso once again falls pregnant. But this time she was reluctant in telling Dutugo that she had fallen pregnant again. So as you know, in 2020, what was starting to happen around the world, there was this talk of this virus called Cororo. Well, you know what I'm talking about. I can't necessarily say it here on YouTube because YouTube frowns upon that. So anyways, so as you know that countries around the world were warning their citizens to make sure that they take care of themselves. So just before the lockdown that took place in 2020, that is when Tsekhofatso told Ndutugo that she was pregnant. And the interesting part about her pregnancy, she kept it from Dutugo for quite a long time before she broke the news to him. She was already almost eight months pregnant when she told Dutugo about her pregnancy. Of course, Dutugo flipped. He was not happy. Hearing that Tsekhofatso was pregnant once again, guess what he did? Once again, he ordered Tsekhofatso to commit an abortion. But this time she stood her ground and told Ndutugo that there is no way that she is terminating another pregnancy. Ndutugo was angry. He was livid. But Tsekhofatso did not understand why Ndutugo did not want children. So she just stood her ground and said, I'm sorry, I'm keeping this baby. So eventually when we went under lockdown and they kept going back and forth, back and forth, I mean, 
during that lockdown, nobody was allowed to go out. So Ndutugo was living at his own place while Tsekofalso lived with her aunt in Midlands. So they could not necessarily meet. Ndutugo could not drive to Soweto to meet with Tsekofalso where they would talk face to face, where he would look her in the eyes and basically force her to commit an abortion. And at the same time, Tsekofalso felt a little bit safe that she was at a distance from Ndutugo and therefore she could actually go through with the pregnancy and give birth successfully. So eventually Ndutugo had to break the news to Tsekofalso why he was asking her to commit an abortion. Yep, you guessed it right. He was married and Tsekofalso had no idea that her boyfriend is a husband. Well, not necessarily married. So let me explain. So Ntutugo had a traditional wife. In the Zulu culture, there is no such a thing that is an engagement necessarily. We have a process called Lobola. So basically, this is where when a man wants to take a wife, he sends his uncles to the girlfriend's uncles where they sit down and negotiate dowry. I think I've explained this before. And um, once there's an agreement and there's exchange of uh, that dowry, then, uh, then there's a traditional do that takes place like a traditional marriage. And as a result, they are now considered husband and wife versus the Western marriage, which was going to come at a later stage. So in this video, I'm going to refer to Tugo as a married man, not as an engaged man. In the Western culture, he's engaged to be married, but in the Zulu culture, he is already married. So that is why I'm going to say he has a wife, he's married and stuff like that. Anyways, so Ndutugo finally breaks the news to Takofato, telling her that he's actually married. So Takofato, of course, she was heartbroken at hearing this news. She told her aunt about this, that actually the boyfriend that she thought was her own, she is actually the other woman. And then Tsekofaso's aunt was not happy at hearing that she basically called a family meeting to let them know that Tsekofaso was involved with a married man. The uncle, Tsekofaso's uncle, was also not happy. He even told her, he even told her that had we known about this, you would have never been in a relationship with a married man. This is wrong. But unfortunately, at this point, she was already far into it because she was almost eight months pregnant. And as a result of that too, Tsekofaso could not terminate the pregnancy because it was way too late for her to commit an abortion. So Ndutugo and Tsekofaso once again went back and forth, back and forth about committing, about terminating the pregnancy. So of course Ndutugo was quite frustrated at hearing this and he wanted to know why didn't you tell me the moment you found out that you were pregnant. She said, I was afraid of exactly this. And Ndutugo was like, you know what, next time just do what I tell you. So Tsekofaso was like, anyways, it's too late. If you don't want to raise this baby, if you don't want this baby, it's fine. I will raise the baby by myself. You don't have to be involved in the child's life. So when Tutugo kind of like heard those words, that is when he had a change of mind. Out of the blue, Ndutugo was supportive. Ndutugo was looking forward to be a father for the first time. Ndutugo wanted to do everything under the sun for this new arrival baby clothes at the crib, everything that the baby was going to need, all bought by Ndutugo. Why did he change his mind? What happened? What is it that he wants this time? Because he was adamant about not having this baby or being part of this baby's life. But suddenly the house is now filled with baby clothes and baby and baby formulas and the crib, everything that you can imagine a baby would need, they had it. However, Tsekofaso's aunt was like, mm -mm, something ain't right here. Something, her instincts were telling her something was not, was not right. However, she could not put her finger on it, what it was, so that she can advise her niece appropriately. But she just dismissed it and thought, okay, maybe he had a change of mind. And uh, he realized that he was basically denying a whole human being. So she just let it go. But the family were quite disappointed that Tsekofaso was involved with a married man. Despite Tsekofaso being in a relationship with this man for two years without knowing that he was married, including his own wife, she was unsuspecting 
that her, that her husband was having an affair. However, Wang Tutuko was busy showing love and affection and a change of heart and showing excitement about meeting this baby. He was thinking of a different way to get rid of this baby. And interestingly, Tsako Fatso and Tutugo had already agreed on the baby's name, and it was a baby girl. The part that I'm trying to understand is how in the world did Tutugo manage to hide all of this from his wife, considering the fact that everybody was at home, quarantined, and we were all on each other's faces? How did he manage to hide a whole pregnant girlfriend from his wife. It boggles the mind to me, honestly. I don't know. I don't know. So around April 2020, Tsako Fatso started getting text messages. Now these text messages were threatening. They were basically, they were basically coming from Ndutugo's wife, who was telling her, listen, please leave my husband alone. You are wrecking my household. Please leave him alone. In some days in April, the text would threaten Tsako Fatso that the wife was going to come right at her door and beat her silly because she refuses to leave her husband alone. The final text that came to Tsako Fatso was to tell her that the wife, that I am Dutugo's wife, I am HIV positive. You should get tested as well. All this was an attempt to get Tsako Fatso to terminate the pregnancy. But Tsako Fatso was not phased by these threats. So all that Tsako Fatso was thinking about was preparing for the arrival of her baby in about a month and a half time. However, in the court proceedings, it was clear that Ndutugo Shoba's wife had no idea that Ndutugo was having an affair on her. On top of that, she never sent any text messages to Tsako Fatso because she didn't even know her. So in late April 2020, Tsako Fatso receives a phone call. It came from a woman who was telling her that she is a recruitment agent and therefore she had a job opportunity for her. But before she could give her the job opportunity, which is, cosmo which is cosmetology, she needed to meet this woman at a McDonald's near Gorif City in Johannesburg. But Tsako Fatso was quite taken aback because number one, nobody was allowed to leave their homes. Number two, why the interview is at McDonald's when the interview could take place at their offices. And, and number three, where did this woman get her cell phone number from because she has never sent her resume to a recruitment company before? But because she was desperate for a job, she thought, okay, let me take my chances, take a Uber to McDonald's where they were going to have this interview. And but but she was very uneasy about doing so because she was only afraid of getting caught by the police just moving about when she's supposed to be at home. In South Africa, during that lockdown, the National Disaster Management Act was already the law and nobody was allowed unless if you left your home, you had gone for an emergency or you had gone to buy an essential good. So Tsako Fatso took her friend and they came up with a story that if they ever got caught by the police, they would just tell them that they are going to do some essential food stuff to buy at the mall. So when Tsako Fatso and the friend arrived at McDonald's near Gorif City, south of Johannesburg, they stood there waiting for a woman to pop up. To pop up. Well, McDonald's at that time during lockdown was closed, so nobody was necessarily going into McDonald's because everybody was at home. So she decided to stand there and wait for this woman. Unfortunately, the woman did not arrive. So Tsako Fatso decided to call, this woman's, to call this woman's number and ask her where she was. And indeed, she kept calling, calling, but to no avail. However, the woman sent a text apologizing to Tsako Fatso that she was held up in meetings, mind you. We are on lockdown, quarantined, nobody is allowed to go out. How exactly is she in meetings the whole day when she's supposed to be at home? 
She didn't even mention that whether the meetings were on Zoom, but she just said she's been busy the whole day in meetings. So Tarofato then made it some sort of excuse, like maybe it's like a Zoom call meeting, whatever the case might have been. However, the woman said to Tarofato, I'm going to send you a transport that will pick you from where you at and bring you to my office. Again, office, why are you at the office when you're supposed to be at home? And that is when Tokofato was feeling rather uncomfortable to go into a stranger's car. So she declined and said, you know what? Never mind. I'm no longer interested in this job because I'm not, I don't feel safe going into a vehicle that I don't know. So Tokofato and the friend returned home. Oh, I forgot to mention that the vehicle was a gray Jeep that was sent by this woman. So about a week later, this is the 4th of June, 2020. That is when Dutuko Shoba calls Tekofato and say, listen, I would like you to come over to my place. I am going to request an Uber to bring you over. We need to talk the final arrangements of the arrival of, the, of our baby. So of course, Tekofato was quite happy to hear that. This call came at night and Tekofato was already asleep when she received a call from Dutugo. So Tekofato, because she was concerned about the number of things that she needed for the baby, she woke up, went to her aunt's room and told her that, listen, Dutugo just called. He wants us to have a conversation to finalize the arrival of the baby. So there are a few things that I want to tell him that the baby might need because we are in quarantine and she doesn't want to run out of those things. If Kororo persisted and maybe she might not even have time or money to take the baby to a clinic or hospital. So the aunt once again did not feel very good about this phone call coming at this time of the night, but since Ndutugo had a change of heart, she did not want she did not want to become between Tsakofato and Ndutugo, so she consented that she can leave and go and go to Ndutugo. Indeed, an Uber pulled up outside of Tsakofato's house. She entered the vehicle and went to Ndutugo's apartment. At about 8 p.m. that evening, Tsakofato Pule arrives at Ndutugo's apartment and they began to talk and they spent some time together in Dutugo's apartment. However, while they were busy having a conversation and finalizing the arrival of their baby, Dutugo decided was getting text messages and calls from his wife. Tsekofaso knew who was making these calls and so she was getting a little irritated by the calls and the text messages from his wife. So she decided that, listen, I need to go back home. I feel, I feel a little tired so we can continue this conversation some other day. Go and attend to your wife. So at 9.45 p.m. on the 4th of June, 2020, Ndutu Oshoba requested an Uber to take back Tsekofaso to her home. So both Takofato and Dutugo went out of Dutugo's apartment and went outside the apartment complex where they stood in front of the gate waiting for the Uber. Unfortunately, the Uber did not arrive. That is when Dutugo was like, okay, the Uber is not arriving. Let's go back in because it's, it's a bit cold. And then I will request once again for another one. Indeed, Dutugo and Takofato went back into the apartment where he requested once again another round. So at 10.06, a great jeep, well, we're assuming it's the Uber, pulled up in front of Ndutugo and Tsekofato. And that was the last time Tsekofato was seen alive. Seeing that Tsekofato has not returned home for the past two days, Tsekofato's family began to worry. So they started making calls around calling Tsekofato's friends to ask if they heard anything from her. And they were all like, no, we haven't heard anything from Tsekofato. Even though we tried calling her several times, she would not pick up. As a matter of fact, her cell phone is on voicemail, something that she has never done before. So Tsekofaso's aunt then asked the friends if they could please call Ndutugo Shoba and ask the whereabouts of Tsekofaso. Now, this part kind of like reminds me of Karabo Mukwena, who was murdered by her boyfriend by the name of Sandile Mansui. 
So one of the friends then calls in Dutugo Shoba to ask the whereabouts of Tekofatso. That is when Dutugo was like, hey, she was at my place about two days ago. I requested her an Uber, and then that was the last time I saw her when she left with the Uber. So being a concerned boyfriend, he then asked the friend, what's the next step? That is when the friend was we are going to the police and report her missing. That is when Tutuko Shoba was like, okay, wait for me, I'm coming. Because the police will probably want to question me because I was the last person to see her. So they were like, okay, fine, good idea. At the police station, they reported Teko Faso as missing. Of course, the police took down the statement and it was in Tutuko's statement because he was the last person to be with Teko Faso. And so he told the police basically he requested her to come over. He ordered her an Uber to come to his place. They had a conversation at 10 at night. Then he requested another, he requested an Uber and she went home. And that was the last time he saw her. And so the police were interested to know if his apartment complex had a CCTV footage just to verify his story. That is when Tutuko Shoba was like, yes, there is a CCTV camera. I'm sure the footage will speak for me as well or confirm what I'm telling you. So the police indeed, they went to Tutuko Shoba's apartment complex, requested for the CCTV footage of the 4th of June, 2020. So when the police viewed the CCTV footage, indeed it collaborated with Tutuko Shoba's story. So he was not a suspect. Now the police want to know where exactly is Tako Fatso. One of the police were like, okay, fine, you know what? Since in Tutuko Shoba's apartment complex CCTV footage is a little bit grainy, it could not necessarily tell the number plate or the plate number to check who this Uber vehicle belongs to. So when they checked through the records, they found out that actually the plate number was fake. That is when the police realized that they may have a murder on their hands. So one of the police were like, okay, listen guys, since the CCTV footage is a little grainy and we have a missing pregnant woman, why don't we check all the CCTV footages of other complexes next to Ndutuko Shoba's apartment complex? That was a great idea. So they started checking. Uh, basically following this jeep through all the other CCTV footages from complexes along that road. As they were busy following the jeep through those other CCTV footages, the police struck a huge break when they realized that the, the plate number at the back of the, of the jeep had fallen off. Basically, the fake plate number had fallen off, revealing the original or the authentic number plate. When they ran through it, they discovered that the vehicle was registered in a man by the name of Muzi Malapane. So in this video, I'm going to be referring to him as Muzi because his name is a little long. So I'm just going to say Muzi. So the police then decided to go to Muzi's house. Muzi is a very well-known criminal. He is a hijacker. He is basically a mugger. He lives a very horrible, he's basically a horrible criminal, a well-known criminal in Soweto. So they went and picked him up for an interview. So at the police station, Muzi was like, uh, so why am I here? He was basically playing a fool. The police were like, ah, you know why you are here. He was like, I have no idea. I have not committed any crime. It's locked down. I've been with my family the whole time. So what crime have I committed this time? So the police were like, you took Tako Fatsopule in your car. He was like, who is Tako Fatsopule? I have no idea who that is. So the police were like, we see that you are trying to play us for a fool, but let's show you something. So they show him the CCTV footages and they show him that actually the number plate or the plate number at the back of your vehicle, the fake one had fallen off. And this is your number plate. When Muzi realized that, oops, I did not realize that. That is when he was like, um, okay. Clearly, the evidence is overwhelming, and that is when he decided to strike a deal with the police. He basically said to the police, if you are going to give me a deal, a plea deal, I'm going to um, tell you everything. Basically, he turned into a state witness. 
provided that he was going to get a shorter sentence. Now, in our criminal justice, that is allowed, provided that you are not going to lie on the stand and that you are going to tell the whole tea. And so that is exactly what Muzi did. He did tell the police that he and the mastermind who happened to be his childhood friend was the one that ordered a hit. Basically, Ndutuo knew that Muzi was a well-known criminal. He was a, basically a career criminal. And so he probably he knew people who could murder people because the call that Muzi got from Dutuba was, hey, dude, do you know somebody that can murder somebody for me? And that is when um, Muzi was like, hey, dude, do not destroy your life like that. You are successful, educated, and all that stuff. Why would you want to do something like that? So Dutuba tells Muzi that, listen, I'm going to pay whoever is going to do this job for me 70,000 rand. And on top of that, I am waiting for 8 million rand from my wife's mother's passing on who had a life insurance of 8 million rand. So they are just waiting for a payout. When Muzi heard about the 70,000 rand pay, he was like, okay, listen, I'm going to do it myself. I don't have to hire anyone for you. I will do it. I think Dutuwa, that's exactly what he wanted because he was going to do the perfect job as far as he was concerned. Dutuwa gave Muzi the instructions that the murder needs to look like a suicide. So when the police asked Muzi, why didn't Dutuwa want Sehofatsu killed? That is when he said it's because he, he wanted to hide the pregnancy from his wife. And he also did not want his wife to leave him because if his wife left him, he would lose out on the 8 million rand payout. Ndutogo emphasized and re-emphasized that the murder needs to look like a suicide, like she hanged herself on a tree. So on the 4th of June, 2020, when Terofazo went to Ndutogo's home to have a conversation, about the final arrangement for the child's arrival. And when he called the Uber, he was basically calling Muzi to come and fetch her so he can do the job. So when Terofato and Dutuo stood outside waiting for an Uber, it was the gray Jeep. Remember the gray Jeep was the same gray Jeep that had come sent by that woman who wanted to interview Terofato. And basically that plan failed because Tsekofatso did not go into the vehicle. So after picking up Tsekofatso Pule at Ndutugo Shoba's apartment complex, they drove to a bridge. There was a bridge that Ndutugo had instructed Muzi to hang up from. But when he got to that bridge, it was too busy. So he became afraid to just tie her and throw her over the bridge, hanging, hanging her basically. So he then decided to take her to a place in North Khasekh, which is not far from Soweto. There was an open felt where he opened fire, basically shooting her several times on her chest. When she died, he threw her at the back of the Jeep and then drove to Rudaport. When he got to Rudaport, that is when he found a tree, tied the noose around her neck and then hanged her from there. So it's not quite clear who found Tsekhofaso hanging from the tree, but we know that the police found her hanging from a tree in Rodeport and they knew that it was not a suicide because of the bullet wounds on her chest. They knew right there that they had a homicide investigation on their hands. So on the 19th of February, 2021, Muzigayi Malapane was then sentenced to 20 years imprisonment for his involvement in the murder of Tsekhofaso Pule. So Tsekhofaso's aunt was not happy with Muzi's sentence of 20 years imprisonment. She said her biggest worry is the fact that what if Muzi is a model prisoner? Because in South Africa, when you're a model prisoner, you actually get released earlier on good behavior. So she felt that at least he should have gotten a harsher sentence than just 20 years, considering the fact that he was the one who killed her, basically pulled the trigger, shot her several times, drove her to, uh, to Rudaport and hanged her from a tree. The aunt said, this man is cold-blooded. She said you could tell with his demeanor in court that he didn't care. She felt that he deserved to rot in prison, not 20 years. So immediately after Muzi was sentenced to 20 years in prison for the murder of Tsekhofatso Pule, then the police focused on Dutuo Shoba. They went and arrested him. He was at home with his wife. 
That is when the wife found out for the first time that her husband had a girlfriend who was pregnant because the police had come to arrest him for her murder. She was shocked. She was like, what? Now, the evidence against Ndutuko Shobam was overwhelming. Everything that Muzi told the police it was collaborated by text messages, phone calls, visitations, all pointed that Ndutuko Shoba was indeed the mastermind. However, Ndutuko Shoba denied every charge that was laid before him, but only two he was charged for. The conspiracy to murder Tsekofatso Pule, as well as defeating the ends of justice, that is obstruction of justice in a nutshell. So he was taken to trial and on trial Ndutugo Shoba was just denying, denying, denying. He was explaining every single evidence that was put on the table. The one evidence that actually put a final nail on Ndutugo Shoba's coffin was the CCTV footage that he had relied on. Remember, he was the last one to see Tokofato go with an Uber he had requested. But when they looked closer, at the CCTV footage, they saw a lot of discrepancy from Dutugo's story. That also included the three minutes that is unaccounted for between 10.06 and 10.09. What happened in between there? Did Tsekofato go into that Jeep voluntarily or she did not? Me, I think she recognized the Jeep from last week and thought, why is the same Jeep here to pick me up as an uber so she probably decided like you know what i'm not going into this vehicle but she pro probably she was overpowered by both the driver and Ndutugo, or the driver already had people who got out of the car grabbed her threw her in the car and pinned her down and then they drove off so we don't know what exactly happened and how exactly did Ndutugo manage to go to the complex's security to wipe out that three minutes that is unaccounted for on that CCTV footage. However, Ntutuko Shoba could not explain the unaccounted three minutes in that CCTV footage. All he could tell the court was probably there was a glitch in the, uh, in the CCTV camera. So the court was like, mm, un highly unlikely because the camera was working perfectly fine. Why at that moment that happened? He was like, it's a coincidence maybe. So on the 25th of March, 2022, Ndutuko Shoba's trial finalized with a guilty verdict because the court did not believe a word that came out of his mouth, defending himself about the evidence that was put before the court. Judge Stuart Wilson, this is what he said in his findings. Count one, guilty for premeditated murder of Tsekofat Zopolem and count two, not guilty for defeating the ends of justice or obstruction of justice, whichever way you put it. So on the 10th of May, 2022, Ndutuko Shoba will return to court for mitigation of sentence as well as sentencing. The state plan on asking the court to sentence him to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. The family and friends of Tsego Fatsopule were elated at the judgment. They were very happy. They thought Ndutuko Shoba got what he deserved. So I think that on the 10th of May 2022, Ndutuko Shoba will indeed get a life sentence without the possibility of parole. Simply because in court, he did not admit to anything. He showed absolute no remorse or could care less about the death of his girlfriend as well as his unborn baby. Now, the reason why he was not charged with the murder of his unborn child as well, that is because in South Africa, when a woman is pregnant, it is called fictitious, meaning it's almost like a phantom pregnancy. I don't know why, that's how I, that's our law. And the principle is called nasketerious fiction, basically meaning that, yeah, there is a human being, but isn't, there's no human being, basically. I think that's the reason why abortion is allowed in South Africa because of that principle, Nascaterius fiction. So that is why he's not charged with the murder of both Tsekofatso and the unborn baby. It's just Tsekofatso. So I hope that Ndutugo, my namesake, will go to prison and start rotting there and also say hi to his fellow murderer of Karabo Mukwena, Sandile Mansui. Well, that is it, guys, with the case of Tsekofatso Pulem. 
So I will highly appreciate it if you left me a comment down below and let me know what you think of this case, especially what happened in that three minutes, do you think? And I will also highly appreciate it if you share this video far and wide. And thank you for watching. And I will see you next time with a new true crime video. Goodbye.